Um, as you can see, the title of our talk today is The Nature and Assessment of the Study Abroad Classroom. We're also going to be talking about program assessment and the facilitation of effective uh, study abroad programs. These are two, uh, the top two, the nature and assessment are two things that have gotten rather short shrift in our literature. So, okay. Okay. Um, as you can see, recent research validates the high value that study abroad experiences have traditionally been known to impart as they relate to intercultural learning and global awareness, second language acquisition, disciplinary learning, and other positive long-term effects. So as you can see from this list here, uh, many of these uh, articles and uh, works are going to be extremely familiar either because you've read them or you've authored them in many cases. <laughs> Um, we have uh, some of the trends in the past, and I see this at the conference as well. Assessment of learning outcomes such as grammatical and competencies, such as grammatical, lexical, pragmatic, strategic, interactional, intercultural, sociolinguistic. And then identity in the study abroad context. There must be seven or eight strands of that here at the conference, which is wonderful to see. Um, and it's identity, uh, not just the role of identity in the development of student outcomes, but the role of the context, study abroad context, on the development of identity. And both of those things have been looked at. And then you have social networks and interactions. And unfortunately, at this moment, there is a talk I would like to attend <laughs> next door it's precisely on social networks. Um, since my other area is call, I'm really interested in that. Uh, individual characteristics, heritage learner identity, which is extremely important, becoming more important all the time, as more of our students perhaps are from heritage learner backgrounds, and of course then the use of technology. But despite all of this rich academic tradition of the study of these topics, uh, to date there's been a lot of a lack of research on the nature of the context, the classroom, etc., and how that might study abroad classroom affect uh, these learning outcomes and development of identity. So um, here we have the other focus of today's talk is assessment, not only of the classroom, but of the study abroad programs. Um, the first thing should look extremely familiar to those of you that have done the dreaded APR, otherwise known as Academic Program Review from North Central, et cetera. Um, at ASU, we do it every seven years. And that sounds like a long time, but it really isn't. Um, so there are regional accreditation processes for higher education that f in the US that force program assessment uh, every seven years at least. Uh, this has been reported on, as you can see the reference there. Um, they measure the extent, they're supposed to measure the extent to which programs meet the outcomes and the goals of those programs either based on the actual proficiency scale, national standards, et cetera. But those are the scales that are used the most in the United States. Of course, we'll talk about what's used in other parts of the world in a moment. And they also, the purpose of those reviews is also to propose improvements to assure a high quality of second and foreign language instruction. However, with programs abroad, it isn't necessarily as consistent or that simple. To date, no studies that I know of, at least, or that we know of, have been published that discuss in detail the evaluation of pedagogical practices in study abroad classrooms used to reach program goals um, in, those, uh, in those classrooms and study abroad contexts. There have been student opinion surveys, as you can see the reference here, but how do we know that they reflect actual practices? So we took it upon ourselves. Uh, as an initial attempt, and I really, really stress that. This is only a survey. It is the first part of an attempt uh, to describe what's happening in the target language uh, study abroad classrooms. A survey was administered to program directors in Spanish-speaking countries offering those programs. Um, the current study then looks specifically at the nature of essay programs and classrooms. Uh, we focused on student interaction with native speakers and non-native speakers in various types of programs and the use of certain curricula and materials, the assessment of pedagogical practices, evaluation of, of academic programs, and personnel, how that's done uh, in those programs, and the use of various pedagogical approaches and interventions. Then preliminary implications, because again, this is only a survey, 
are proposed for creation of appropriate learning outcomes, increasing interaction, uh, effective pedagogical interventions, uh, development of effective essay programs <coughs> via the evaluation of those programs and its personnel. And then we will end with suggestions for future research. And now I will turn it over to my colleague to talk about the study itself. So our participants were study abroad directors and U.S. professors who participated in some way in a study abroad program. We sent out the invitation to 146, and 28 responded to all the questions. We had a number that went halfway through and didn't complete it. It was quite long. Program venues. Um, the survey results reflect the, the reality of mostly peninsular study abroad programs who responded to this. Uh, more research is needed uh, on Latin American programs. Uh, we used SurveyMonkey to collect our data. It, was, uh, it contained 81 questions and it took about 30 minutes to complete. And uh, the procedure, like I said, we emailed the link to the various directors and then we, the data analysis, we did a quantitative look at all the results by, by reporting percentages and we looked at the qualitative responses. Um, the, the acquisition of pragmatic and intercultural competence in the study abroad context depends greatly on the integration in the target language culture and community. Therefore, measures of student interaction were taken from uh, their, their housing preferences. First, we also want to see what was offered to them and then their preference based on those, their ability to directly enroll in the host institution, of course, what was offered to them, and other, if there were other structured interactions that were facilitated by the program. Uh, uh, regarding housing options, those 71% uh, of the programs offered host family, 14% apartments, 14% dorms, and 4% hostels. Of course, there's a mix and match of uh, offering all three, only two, all one, or uh, just one. And this is the preference. When uh, all three, uh, so it, uh, only 11 of the 28 programs offered a, the student a choice. Five offered all three, and that's the first one, host, family, apartment, dorm, and of the preference, the student preference was to live in an apartment, according to these results. Uh, five offered the students to choose between a host, family, and apartment, and 60% of the students preferred the host, family, and only one program offered the, um, the option between a host, family, and a dorm, and uh, the preference was, it was only one, uh, one to live with the host, family. Note, the other program directors either didn't answer or said they didn't know because they only offered one type of housing. So that's why you have 11, it didn't mean that the other programs only offered usually, and we'll see that later too. So 89% of the directors who offered a choice in living uh, options did notice a difference between the achievements of students living with Spaniards, <coughs> excuse me, living gosh, with Spanish speakers. And, any of the three housing settings, and those who lived and spent time speaking English. Uh, they generally attain, so their perception was, they generally attain a higher proficiency in Spanish and have more engagement in the community. These answers confirm studies on the positive effects of living with the, a host family and their impact, um, um, and their impact uh, on pr language proficiency. I kind of deleted that from my thing. Direct enrollment and structures and inter interactions. Uh, another opportunity for student uh, interaction with native speakers is through the opportunity to direct enroll in host university courses, of which 14 out of 28 offered. That's 50%. Um, and then, in addition, all programs facilitated some type of structured interactions, which increased opportunities for students to contact with native speakers. We have internships, service learning activities, which 23 of the 28 offered, uh, and language, um, uh, native speaker language partners, <coughs> intercambios. Uh, it is apparent that study abroad programs are becoming acutely aware of increasing student interaction types with uh, L2 speakers so as to develop interactional competence and enhance the study abroad experience. And this, this is what we've been seeing with the other presentations earlier today. So, 
We also looked at um, the curriculum and the materials we use in the classroom. So what happens in the language classroom? Uh, the general sense appears to be that because these programs accommodate students from the U.S., the, that the program curriculum parallels that of the U.S. with systematic coordination, syllabi, and course components. The other question, can the U.S. institution make suggestions and or require changes to curriculum? Well, if, you know, if, the pre if, if they're already having this parallel program, the assumption is yes. However, 78% um, agreed um, that if something in the curriculum is not considered effective, the program director and professors of the U.S. institutions were free to make suggestions and or require changes to curriculum used at the host institution. But five did state that this liberty is not a possibility, especially if the course is offered by an affiliated host institution over there. Uh, and who do the textbooks cater to? All the curriculum uh, is approved. <laughs> The approaches in the language classroom are different. 81% of the, so 13 of the 16 programs in Spain use books published in Spain and whose audience is for any person learning Spanish regardless of their L1. The other three didn't provide an answer or put NA. In Latin America, all of them 100% use textbooks published in the USA for students whose L1 is English. One program director from Spain who was familiar with the program, direct, who was familiar with the Latin American program because he did uh, also direct programs down there, said that US students, this is him, complain at times that the language books have no English in them when, in the Spanish program. So evaluation of the academic personnel, how are the program faculty evaluated? Um, well, when we ask that, uh, let's see, so the U.S. faculty are anonymously evaluated by the students in the courses. Sound familiar? That's common practice here in the U.S. However, another picture arises when discussing the evaluation of permanent or part-time host country faculty. Some say that they themselves carry out the evaluation as program directors of some of the courses or on a needs basis. That's usually when renewing a contract that they said. Four directors mentioned that it is not customary to have students evaluate the host instruction institution faculty. So this suggests a, different, a difference in faculty evaluative procedures among the U.S. and host countries. And this could suggest an area of future study, a further study in understanding how these faculty are evaluated and what information can be gathered from them. Student evaluations and teaching, although at times dreaded by us, tend to give a fair picture of weaknesses and strengths in teaching practices. Would host country instructors and study abroad programs benefit from such feedback? Uh, pedagogical approaches, the similarities, usually they teach grammar, uh, how they measure um, um, the evaluations used during the semester exams. They, use, they say they use a communicative method. They use a target language in class almost 100% of the time. They break into the, the students' L1 occasionally. Homework assignments are usually the same. They, they encourage oral participation. Teaching styles, grammar focus, using language and context. Some will be more traditional, they said, in the classroom. Uh, others uh, on the use, feel like they use uh, language and context more, but I think that's the same kind of reaction, re reflection that we have here in the United States in, in the classroom. But this is what they say happens in the classroom. Uh, that they are doing. We need to follow up with on-site interviews and, of course, observation of actually what's going on. Because one thing is to report what they think is going on and then seeing what actually is. Assessment standards, uh, these are the differences. The U.S. mostly relies on ACTFL. No, it relies on ACTFL. And in Spain and Latin America, we see the preference for SUFFER, the common European framework of reference for language, languages. Uh, interventions. Uh, many programs abroad are starting to pay more and more attention to the student's psychological well-being, paying close attention to acculturation, and focusing on intercultural awareness. Those students are encouraged during group, group work or homework assignments to critically reflect on their experience or being abroad. And these were some of the um, things that the, the way they set that up, either gathering incorporated into the language class, one-on-one -on -one meetings, weekly or monthly group meetings, and one program even said they, they start a one-credit course, a cross-cultural competence course that they have to attend. 50% uh, provided at least one of the above that I just mentioned. 
to reflect on their experience. The other programs uh, relied on students to contact the program director and or the on-site staff to assist with non-academic issues. Better success in the program was observed when the students were also given the opportunity to reflect on their learning process and strategies when abroad. Okay, Barbara? So, bringing it home. <laughs> Uh, implications for study abroad programs. Obviously, these are preliminary implications, but I think uh, what we found here is certainly uh, is consonant with what I experienced, and I think what Cassie experienced as directors. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a survey finding and then some recommendations. Uh, creation uh, of appropriate learning outcomes and objectives. Uh, survey respondents reported, of course, the use of CEFR rather than uh, ACTFL on the courses that they create. This comes, I am also the person at my university that does the equivalencies for the study abroad program in Spain. And so I know what A1 and B2 mean, but the students probably don't. And so that should be part of a pre-departure uh, orientation if it isn't already. Um, and then uh, the uh, survey respondents suggested that students would get more out of programs. This is very important. If they possessed the following before arriving in country, better grammatical knowledge base, we talked about that, deeper understanding of US and world history and their own culture and other cultures, um, obviously advise students accordingly, uh, provide guidance for them to reflect on the development of their intercultural competence and other things, perhaps using e-portfolios, which they've been doing in Europe for years, of course. Uh, creation of uh, survey participants reported integration of study abroad and home institution curricula. Well, I believe perhaps sometimes that is the case, but it certainly paints a very rosy picture of all kinds of articulation I'm not sure is taking place, so we need to investigate that more. And uh, in any case, recommendations. Um, create theoretically grounded study abroad objectives based on models of communicative intercultural competence. There's a couple of examples of those models right here. Uh, set appropriate objectives for heritage learners of varying proficiency in the language to facilitate their acculturation process and, of course, provide awareness training to host families. <coughs> There's all kinds of research talking about uh, the need for doing that. Um, to increase the interaction, um, obviously vetted opportunities not only to live with native speakers but to act and play and work with native speakers. So in addition to, to the uh, host family, of course, ideally with no other English speakers, uh, steering them toward living options with native speakers or toward um, the kind of recreational activities. The student in my program, when I went took the group to Granada, that made the most progress was a computer science student. She was a beginner. She knew no Spanish. I took her with me to do email at the Centro de Informatica. She made friends with these computer science majors at the university, and her Spanish just blossomed. It was amazing. So take them with you wherever you're going, you know, and uh, try to introduce them to people. Um, and then uh, make sure the families actually talk to them, of course. Uh, internships, service learning, conversation partners, we've talked about that in other, in other um, uh, pre presentations. And these are opportunities for what I call Excel research, experiential language learning, and ICC. So survey respondents also noted a variety of pedagogical approaches, so they're conservative as well as communicative approaches. 81% uh, of the Peninsular programs reported use of materials, of course, that do not use English. We talked about that. Um, so there are some recommendations. Require that students analyze and produce authentic written and oral discourse genres that can, and can be evaluated using ecologically valid assessments, because they're abroad, they should be able to do that. Utilize focused pedagogical interventions that teach students how to interact with native speakers. Uh, Shively, of course, uh, has several articles on that. Requiring students to utilize social media uh, to create relationships before, during, and after their stay there. And to understand local netiquette and the kinds of things you might be doing texting. Uh, and then, a little bit controversial, but there are some <laughs> online resources now that weren't available when I was there. Uh, for English explanations of grammar if they absolutely have to have those. Uh, survey respondents said only half of the programs offered opportunities to directly enroll in host institution classes. That's usually for exchange students that do that rather than study abroad students. 
But I'm thinking if we, in partnership with the host institution, actually created new courses having to do with the linguistic minorities in that host country, if they don't already exist, intercultural competence, sociolinguistics, Spanish for specific purposes, and Spanish language media, and then invite native speakers to the classes, or maybe even see if the, if the university students there could actually enroll in those classes taught by our faculty. Uh, then create the weekly meetings that we talked about before, or of course have directors and staff to assist them. Um, also, survey respondents noted as systemic coordination, again. Uh, but the important thing is that almost 80% report having the ability su to suggest or require curricular changes, which means 20% do not, and the, the number could actually be actually larger. Uh, require that essay programs be assessed in situ by U.S. professors who carry out in-depth evaluations perhaps teaching as a visiting professor, et cetera, and investigate what happens in the classroom, observation, et cetera, through uh, interviews with all the stakeholders. Uh, getting to the end, survey respondents reported dissimilar evaluations of uh, U.S. versus uh, host institution personnel. So U.S. professors, of course, get the observations that Cassie was talking about, but we have to know the host institution, who eval evaluates them, on what basis, how often, uh, what are the criteria used, et cetera, so that we can you know, create a focus group and see what the best way to do that would be. Limitations. Obviously, the survey at, at this point in the study was the sole source of the data. Need for triangulation with all kinds of on-the-ground qualitative uh, research dealing with interviews, all the stakeholders. Um, relatively small number of respondents. You know, we're getting more every day. <laughs> And the data was collected uh, here, you know, on a cross-sectional design by researchers in the U.S. And of course, we need a mixed methods approach uh, with longitudinal studies. Um, okay, to conclude, more information is needed on these types of programs. Uh, need to evaluate the structures and practices. So you get the information, and then you need to evaluate them in terms of what your students need and your institution wants them to have. And the assessment should take place via ongoing professional partnerships between home and host institutions in order to create and recreate learning contexts that can best assist our students to develop communicative and intercultural competence during their stay abroad. Thank you. <laughs>